they look good and they have to last three years. That's true. You know, I left them in the box. That's funny, too. They're very green now. I left them in They're the what, box. They, they get all moldy and brown. That's Good afternoon. And welcome to the worship of God with First Baptist Church on this Palm Sunday. You know, Palm Sunday is the first day of Holy Week, and it's such an important day that the church staff and I didn't want to go without this worship service to start off Holy Week together. So we waited for the water to go down enough for Beth and John to get out of Ambleside uh, and not put their lives at risk. <laughs> And we are now here for this time of worship together on this Palm Sunday. A special thank you to Ann Shumate for uh, her work on the palm arrangements that uh, are here in the sanctuary uh, for this special day. Um, palm Sunday is, uh, is the beginning of Holy Week. It's, it's the final installment of Jesus' story, this trajectory now of uh, entry into Jerusalem, and then Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. That's where we are as a congregation now, as a group of Christians trying to follow the way of Jesus. Of course, the sermon today and the music will all be wrapped around the idea of Palm Sunday, following Jesus, the triumphal entry, uh, the Palms and the Passion. So welcome to the worship of God today uh, with First Baptist Church. We're glad you're here. And uh, I'm going to offer just, just a couple words that uh, call us together to worship. They are from uh, Mark's Gospel, and they will sound familiar, and you'll hear them again in the Gospel lesson. Blessed is the coming kingdom, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the coming kingdom, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Welcome to worship.
It wouldn't be Palm Sunday without that piece of music right there. And it's Palm Sunday, and thank you, Teresa. <laughs> when we gather for worship at First Baptist Church, we observe a time of confession. We do that uh, because we believe that God's grace is large enough to cover us. We do it because it puts us in the proper posture for the living of our human lives in the presence of God's divine presence. So from the 118th Psalm, these few words that call us to confession today. Let us confess our sins to God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Will you contemplate your prayers of confession as I pray for all of us together? We confess that we have sinned, and although we'd like to deny it, we have forsaken you. We're horrified by the suffering we cause to you, ourselves, and to the world you created. Open the gates of your forgiveness. Restore us in your love for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as I said, when we confess, we are assured of our forgiveness. That's what these words say, taken from Isaiah 50, one of the lectionary texts for today. The Lord God helps us. We will not be disgraced. The Lord God helps us. Who can declare us guilty? Beloved, beyond the shadow of a doubt, your sins are forgiven. By the mercy of Christ, let us stand together, forgiven and free. Today's first lesson comes from the 118th Psalm. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. Let Israel say it, God's faithful love lasts forever. Open the gates of righteousness for me so I can come in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. Those who are righteous enter through it. 
I thank you because you answered me, because you were my saving help. The stone rejected by the builders is now the main foundation stone. This has happened because of the Lord. It is astounding in our sight. This is the day the Lord acted. We will rejoice and celebrate in it. Lord, please save us. Lord, please let us succeed. The one who enters in the Lord's name is blessed. We bless all of you from the Lord's house. The Lord is God. He has shined a light on us. So lead the festival offering with ropes all the way to the horns of the altar. You are my God. I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will lift you up high. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. second reading is from the gospel according to Mark. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, go to the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, its master needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus had said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancient ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered the Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. So I'm going to take responsibility today for the words on your screen not matching what was just read. That was my bad when I text the gospel lesson to Phil this week. You know, Mark 11, 1 through 11 is similar to Mark 1, 1 through 11, enough so that I messed that up. The gospel lesson today is Mark 11. 1 through 11, if you want to look that up in a Bible that you have handy. Uh, sorry, Phil, for that oversight. Palm Sunday. The church staff and I didn't want to miss it this year. Today is the first day of Holy Week, the most sacred season of the year for those of us who call ourselves Christians. On this Sunday each year, we read one of the various versions of the so-called triumphal entry. Today, Jesus does something remarkable. Well, no, remarkable isn't the right word. Jesus does something provocative, something powerful. He mounts a borrowed colt and rides it through the gates of Jerusalem surrounded by peasants stripping off their clothes, waving palm branches, and shouting, Hosanna in the highest, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg 
Historians who study the New Testament texts and the world of the New Testament assert that based on the geography in the gospel, Jesus would have been entering the city of Jerusalem, the provincial Roman capital, by the gate opposite the one used when a Roman emperor or governor comes to town. This isn't the only opposite in this story. The Roman governor would show up dressed resplendently. He would have been mounted on a full-grown animal, one that he owned, not borrowed. He would have been surrounded by very well-dressed, well-trained Roman legions marching in order carrying high his red and gold banners. Jesus sits atop a small, borrowed animal. His feet, I imagine, drag the ground and leave lines in the dirt on both sides of the hoof prints. Immediately to his left and right are his disciples, that ragtag bunch of people that he called from the margins. Ahead of them and behind them are a different kind of Roman legion. Scores of peasants, lepers, prostitutes, slaves, children. The way Luke tells the story, some of them put their clothes on the colt so that Jesus could sit atop them. The way Matthew tells it, a large crowd spread their clothes all over the road in front of Jesus. It makes me wonder, is anyone in this group wearing clothes? What a spectacle. What a brazen move. Jesus rides this borrowed colt through the gate opposite the one used by the governor or the emperor. And among all the opposites, two things remain the same. The palm branches and the hosannas to God. Crossan and Borg believe that Jesus is calling out the Roman Empire. And I think they're right. This first day of Holy Week begins with palms, and it ends, Holy Week does, with the Passion. It's little wonder that it is so. In this Bible story, Jesus incarnates so many of his teachings in one act. As I watch what Jesus is doing here and who he's doing it with, Certain of Jesus' teachings and actions visit me. I hear in the background of my mind, blessed are the poor. I hear in the corner of my hearing, my ear, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I hear Jesus holding up the widow with the two coins and the woman who sweeps her entire house to find her one lost coin, I hear those as examples to the pious in the background of this story. In the crowd that day, I see all of these folks and outcasts and prostitutes and the unclean and the unwelcome with them. The illegals are here too, you know, those lepers that are relegated to colonies at the border of the land. The sinners were there, the woman at the well, the Syrophoenician woman, the woman caught in adultery, they're there. The demon-possessed, the blind, the turncoat tax collectors, and the tenant farmers, all of them I see in the crowd, too. Who else, who else could possibly make up this crowd? 
It's certainly not the religious leaders and the good church going folks with whom Jesus skirmishes throughout the gospel. They're on the other side of this thing, gritting and grinding their teeth. No, it's more likely that some of the 5,000 who Jesus fed in chapter 6 and the 4,000 who Jesus fed in chapter 8 are in this crowd. When I watch Jesus ride that borrowed colt into Jerusalem with his ankles flopping in the dirt, I hear, blessed are the poor, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this, this right here, is what that looks like. For decades, maybe centuries, the church at large has favored a hyper-spiritualized interpretation of this Bible story. You see, we rush past the palms to the passion. We read all of these details that Mark works so hard throughout 10 chapters to weave together into this story. And we start talking about God's anger, Jesus' willingness to placate God by sacrificing himself, and our getting off scot-free as a result. We rush past all the details of this story, and we come up with that interpretation. When we do that, we ignore what's right in front of us in the Bible. When we do that, it lets us off the hook. Jesus here puts it all on the line. We, the church, claim to be followers of Jesus. If we accept this hyper-spiritualized interpretation of this story, this story costs us nothing and gifts us everything. I question any interpretation of the Bible that lets us off the hook that easily. Christ in this story put it all on the line for those he spent his entire ministry loving and serving. We Christ followers should feel the chafing of the cross that such a story as this about our Messiah that we follow puts upon our shoulders. I'm challenged by Palm Sunday, this year, every year. Despite the way that we enter our sanctuary on this day, with the palm branches waving and the hosannas in our mouths, as a pastor, as a religious leader, I very likely would not have been in the crowd. I would have been over on the sidewalk, rolling my eyes, or worse, snarling. As good church-going folks, you very likely would not have been in this crowd. You would have been standing over on the sidewalk with me, aghast, pointing, gawking, shaking your heads at this unsavory, desultory, spectacle. I'm challenged by this story this year, every year, because my place in it is the wrong place. I'm challenged by this story to change that. When I study the Bible, I begin and end with the New Testament Gospels. I begin and end with Jesus Christ. In between, I may take a tour of Genesis or a back road through 1 Thessalonians, but my commitment to being a follower of Christ means that after those trips, I come home to the Gospels. I come home to Jesus' teachings and Jesus' 
actions. And while something in Paul's work may help me interpret my way out of the challenge of Palm Sunday, I feel compelled to take Mark's gospel on its own terms. And Mark's gospel isn't showing me a video clip of Jesus and God playing out some cosmic spiritual battle here. Mark's gospel is showing me Jesus gathering in all those whom he spent his life ministering to. Like a mother hen gathers her brood under her wings and bringing them bringing them in challenge against powers that dehumanize and exclude them. And I'm left on this Palm Sunday with a few simple but profound questions. How am I, a Christ follower, doing that kind of work in my own life? Am I doing that kind of work in my own life. As Fred Craddock taught me to say, he learned it from Jesus, stick it today on that question. Am I doing it today? You feel the urgency in that? We can always say, well, I'll get around to it tomorrow or next week or next month. I intend to do it. So put a today on it. How am I doing that work in my own life? How will I do that kind of work in my life today? This Palm Sunday, who is it that you dehumanize? We all do it. We don't think of it that way, but we all do it. Who is it that you typecast? from a distance, based upon what little you hear said about them around town or in the news? Whose humanity are you watering down to an either or far too simple stereotype? We all do it. This Palm Sunday, who are you excluding? We all do it. To whom are you saying subtly or overtly? Not you. I have to draw the line here. Not you. Whose humanity are we whittling away at by making some part of their God-given self inadequate or insufficient? This Palm Sunday... That's who I believe you are being called by Jesus Christ in and through this Bible story to see, not with your own eyes, but the eyes of God. A reporter once asked theologian Henry Nouwen, what's the one thing, if you could say one thing, what's the one thing you would say to people about God? if given the chance. Now in replied, I would say, you are beloved. Period. Look to Jesus in this Palm Sunday story. If you ever wonder who Jesus would include, he'd include people that are uh, that we good church-going folks struggle to include, and that's a problem for us. Jesus said to his disciples when he call, called them, follow me. That's what he said, follow me. We are called in our baptisms to follow Jesus. Holy Week begins with palms and ends with the passion. Being Christian is risky work in a world that doesn't like grace. 
But the good news, the good gospel news of Palm Sunday and Holy Week is that Good Friday with its electric chair, that Holy Saturday silent as a tomb, neither one of them get the last word. Grace gets the last word. God's grace is what Jesus lived, and God's grace is what raised Jesus from the dead. And God's grace is, will, is what will raise us up when we get beaten down by a world that can't hear the gospel, and we can't stop telling it. So, based on Mark 11, 1 through 11, based on what's actually there in the story, based on what Jesus is doing and with whom he's doing it, go. Go this holy week and stand alongside those who Jesus gathered in and marched with. That's the calling. And grace is abundant so abundant that it will overcome the hardship that you encounter when you love everybody. Grace is abundant, so abundant that it will overcome even death. Go. Go follow Jesus. Amen. Here at First Baptist Church, we have a tradition, a ritual, if you like, that helps guide us through the season of Lent, all the way to Holy Week, all the way to Good Friday, and the cross. It looks a little bit like an Advent wreath, uh, with its purple and rose-colored candles. In fact, some of these candles go in the Advent wreath. But unlike the Advent wreath, it doesn't circle around and grow in light until at last Christ is born. The Lenten lights are linear, set in a piece of wood that looks like a cross. And week by week through the season of Lent, they fade as Lent's shadows lengthen, as Golgotha grows near. We are very near now. We can see the shadow on our shoes now. We are so close. We have been guided this far, and we do this so that we're ready to receive the grace of Easter and resurrection when it comes. Let's pray about that together. God of grace, you call us like you called the disciples to follow you. And you went to some pretty dicey places in your mission to show grace here and now in this world, in this life, to so many people. God, if we're honest, 
we admit that the idea scares us. What if, what if, what if, we say. But we see Jesus doing it. In this story today, we see Jesus doing it in spades. And we're called by it. Called by the baptism that initiated us into this life of Christian faith. Help us, Jesus, to follow you one step at a time to get closer to you each day to go out and minister and live like you in this world. God, if we're honest, we're not even sure we want to pray this prayer, but we hear it in the gospel. And God, something that might help us as we pray this prayer is to pray another one that gives us a lot of comfort a lot of grace and peace, a prayer that says it all just right, the prayer that our Messiah taught us to pray. We join our voices now in one church voice, and we pray that prayer together so that when we get out there in the world busy with your mission, we have it in our hearts. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
There's but one flame left. The cross is so near now. Good Friday. We can see it from here. As I said earlier, this week, this day, begins with palms, and it ends with the passion. Teresa worked hard this week to find music that matched that trajectory. The triumphal entry at the beginning, and this piece that looks toward the passion at the end. As you prepare to go from this place, from this time of worship together, remember the call of Jesus on your life. May the strength of Christ uplift you as you do so. The comfort of the Holy Spirit surround you as you work. And the grace and mercy of God give you hope and give you courage every single day as you go in peace. Amen.